most of our tasks revolve around food, right? Food production, food preparation, and also the fuel that we're gonna cook it with. And you'll see from this picture, I don't know about you, but this is not how I choose the energy that I'm gonna prepare food with, but the reality is, for many people around the world, for many moms, they have to choose every day how they're going to find fuel to prepare food for their kids. And in this picture in the Rubber Market in Kenya, this is one of the choices that women have. This is a bio wood fuel, a biomass fuel, and we would call it wood, fuel wood. So this is a choice that a mom may make. Today, I'm going to choose this fuel to cook the food for my family. It may not be much of a choice at all. It may be all that's available. When moms go home, if you're here at this talk today, the odds are you're not going home to a stove like this. This is called a traditional three stone fire and three billion women a day will go home to a fire like this. If you'll notice in the lower third of the picture, that's her stove. There are three rocks or bricks. It's also called a three stone fire. In between those three stones, a woman will place a biomass fuel, either fuel wood or crop waste or animal dung or charcoal. And over that, she'll place her cook pot. This is a really inefficient and dangerous sort of stove, but the fact is that three billion women every day will cook for their children over a stove just like this. The fact is, as always, women are responsible for keeping the home fires burning. And for three billion, this is the fire that they keep burning. But the reality is, that there's a heavy price and consequences for cooking over a three stone fire. The first is a health consequence. You'll notice that it's difficult really to see what the woman is doing and it's not so much a quality of the picture, it's because of the indoor air pollution that's being produced by this three stone traditional fire that she's cooking on. This is a picture from Nepal. The fact is that every year, two million people will die prematurely because of pollution from indoor fires like this one, from pneumonia or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or from lung cancer from using a traditional stove like this one. A second health consequence is the reality of burns. 195,000 people every year are burned from the flames by an open fire like this one. Either loose clothing catches in the flames and is set on fire, or people will fall into the fire, or their skin will pass over the flames and they'll be badly burned. For 195,000 people, this will mean death. For others, it will mean a permanent disability, or a temporary disability, or disfigurement, or social rejection because of the way that their looks have changed. Another consequence is an environmental consequence. This is a fairly common picture if you were to go to Guatemala. The women and the children are the ones who are responsible for gathering fuel to cook with. So out they go into the environment to gather what they can find. If you take organic matter from the land, for instance, if you remove trees and bushes, you lose the roots that hold the soil in place. So if there's rain, the soil is washed away. So deforestation, people getting wood to burn in their three stone fires, that's the primary cause of deforestation, especially in the developing world. It results in erosion. And as you can guess, if you take animal dung from the land to burn, instead of leaving it on your fields where it can make the land richer, that means food production will drop. So the landscape becomes more and more barren and it's more and more difficult to find the fuel that you need to cook the food for your family. Economics is a real effect of cooking with biomass fuels because these are becoming more and more scarce almost everywhere in the world. 
In the middle of that picture is a pile of charcoal. Maybe some of you have cooked with charcoal, maybe at lunchtime today. Odds are you didn't, but this is charcoal. The price of that pile of charcoal is equivalent to any one of the groups of food items in a circle around it. So if a mom has limited income, she's going to have to make a choice. Am I going to buy fuel to cook my food, or am I going to buy food? That may seem a little extreme, but in some places around the world, people spend 20, 30, 40, 80, or 90 percent of their household income to buy fuel. So if you were a mom, what does that mean you can't buy for your family? And believe it or not, the choices that women have to make to cook for their families have socio-political consequences too. You're looking at Iridimi refugee camp in Africa, and you'll notice it's a very arid landscape. When a transplanted population is brought to a location, there's a very obvious effect on the landscape, and especially because a refugee camp is very clearly defined by fences or boundaries, and when people within the camp need fuel, that means they have to leave the safety of the camp and go into the local area where they're competing with the local people for very scarce fuel. This is usually resented by the local community because they're already struggling to find fuel to cook with. And unfortunately, in reality, what this means is that the women and the children who leave camp to find fuel will be attacked or beaten or raped in order to discourage them from taking these precious local resources. In other camps, they're simply not allowed to leave, which means another difficult choice. Do I have to sell the little food I have to buy charcoal or to buy fuel wood to cook the very little food that's left? When we say gather local fuel, that almost sounds like just a stroll through the neighborhood. But what this means in reality is that women and children will walk overnight, sometimes as far as 30 kilometers or almost 20 miles, to gather fuel for one day. Now, if you're spending all that time gathering fuel, what aren't you doing? And if children are spending time gathering fuel, they're not in school. One solution comes up every morning, and it's so obvious we overlook it. This source of fuel is free. It's available everywhere where there's a sunny day. And the nice thing is, if you look at all of these devices, None of them use biomass fuels. The two solar ovens on the top are actually cooking while this picture is being taken. It looks kind of strange because <coughs> there's no fuel wood, there's no crop waste, there's no animal dung, and there's no charcoal. But cookers <coughs> exist in all different styles and varieties. And the great thing about them is they're very simple. All you need to do is capture sunlight. A black pot will convert sunlight into heat energy, which cooks the food. This is a new way to cook. If you need to add about an hour to your regular cooking time, it takes about two minutes for the cook, one minute to put the food in, and one minute to take the food out when it's done. It's not so bad. Okay. Some days, of course, there is no sun. And if you drove through the storm to get here, you know that today would be one of them. Um, when the sun has gone down in the evening or on days when there's rain or simply there's no sun, there, there are too many clouds, there's a trio of devices that permits women to make great available choices in order to feed their families. First of all, on sunny days, cook with a solar cooker. On days when there is no sun, then use a fuel-efficient stove. And these also can be made with materials that are available locally. In Mexico, some of these stoves are made with a mixture of mud and hay. 
and in Brazil, sometimes they're made with discarded oil cans. Because of their design, they can cook with just a few twigs, with it, what a traditional stove will need a large quantity of biomass fuel to cook with. This is the third one. It's kind of pretty. What it is, is an insulated basket. It's well lined, and in essence, that's a pillow on top. So what I would do is put my food in the solar cooker, get it to the point where it's boiling, let it boil for 10 or 15 minutes, depending on what I'm cooking, and then I take it out of the solar cooker and put it in here. Because right now, all the energy that's needed to keep cooking the food is contained. It's not escaping anywhere. It's well insulated, and that food will continue to cook for four to six hours, which means I can start my next meal cooking in the solar cooker. The great thing about solar cookers, I haven't even mentioned yet. And that is that for most people, for most women who are going home to cook in that three stone fire, probably their local source of drinking water is polluted. What solar cookers can do with a very simple device, it's a little glass vial with a bead of wax in it that melts at 65 degrees Celsius. And that's important because that's the temperature at which a whole variety of microbes that cause waterborne disease are killed. So if you put a WAPI, a water pasteurization indicator, a little glass vial that's reusable, put it in your water in a solar cooker, wait till the, glass till the wax melts and drops in the vial, you know that water's safe to drink. That means your children are going to not drink water that contains worms or Giardia, or Salmonella typhi, or Shigella, or Cryptosporidium, or V. cholera, or E. coli, or rotavirus, or hepatitis A virus. All of these will be killed at 65 degrees Celsius. That's about 149 degrees Fahrenheit. So a solar cooker can cook food that's safe to eat, and it also means your children will have safe water to drink. What you see in this picture with this elderly couple in Kenya is the solar cookers in the forefront, the hay basket or the retained heat basket is right behind it, and then their safe water jar is front and center. And the water that they've pasteurized in their solar cooker is stored in that safe water pot. Solar cookers do make a difference. It means we can avoid using biomass fuels. It means that the land will not be eroded. It means that women will not have to travel so far from home in order to find fuel to cook for their family. It means that they'll save money. They no longer have to make the choice, today do I buy fuel or do I buy food for my kids? And it means that this can gradually become a thing of the past. They won't have to travel 30 kilometers a day. And more importantly, the children who used to go out to find fuel for their families will be able to go to school and get an education. How life-changing that could be. The most interesting thing of all about solar cooking, even though it's so simple and it provides fuel if your energy supply is interrupted during a brownout or a blackout or flex alert days or in the aftermath of a hurricane <coughs> or when there's simply no other fuel around or because it's easier to use than all those combination of things. The most important thing is that governments around the world in areas where this simple technology could do the most good, they're simply not interested. There are plans almost 70 plans posted online that are free uh, for solar cookers of all shapes and sizes made out of all kinds of materials, usually very simple ones that can be found locally. In some places around the world where people can't get aluminum foil to cover cardboard, they use the lining, the shiny lining of cigarette packs. But governments aren't interested. Maybe it's too simple or maybe it's free and therefore uninteresting. But if you really want to change a life, 
put a solar cooker in the hands of someone who might go home to cook in a three stone fire. And you have the ability to change the life of that family. And you can really only change the world one life at a time. Thank you very much.